Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm honored to be joined by Gil Sharon. Gil, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So um, you are here to teach us about uh, really the origins and history of reggae drumming, which you came to my attention from uh, your, your very famous book and DVD, Wicked Beats, which is reggae, rock steady, and Jamaican ska drumming uh, lessons, which is just, I think, very, very well respected in the community. So I'm really, really pumped to have you here. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's it's an honor to be here. And it's it really is an honor to be a representative of this music and just explain it to people. And I love doing it. So I'm I'm excited to jump into this. Yeah. So it's, it's funny because like um, some people might think that like I should be talking to like a traditional Jamaican reggae drummer, but I think it, it should be set up front that you are really, really, really passionate and very knowledgeable about this. And uh, the, what, what's just kind of mind blowing, though, is like you have done so many things which will really kind of dig deeper in at the end. But like Dillinger Escape Plan, Marilyn Manson, mm-hmm. Jerry Cantrell. I mean, you've done a lot of film work. You're all over the yeah. place, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. It's it's funny. Even when I joined Dillinger, there was a lot of like press behind my entrance of that band. And for people that don't know the style of music that Dillinger is, it has nothing to do with Jamaican styles of music. And no. it's extremely uh, extreme metal, heavy music, lots of time changes, yeah. lots of blistering tempos. So they they introduced me in the band and people knew me from this clip on youtube doing like reggae rhythms and it was funny because they'd be like dillinger got a reggae drummer what's going on (laughs) that's hysterical so yeah yeah it's funny but it's definitely even though i play everything and i really don't you know say that loosely i i really do play everything and and i'm music is my life and I can't hold myself down to one style. I've never wanted to be that kind of player that was just an expert in one thing. I always wanted to be like an expert in everything because I just loved it all. And, yeah. you know, I really feel like my my uh, education of the Jamaican styles of music and what I've been through over the years and playing this music for, you know, almost 30 years now and being around the community I, I can say with confidence that I'm a, I'm a good authority figure on the topic. Good. I love that. I, I like uh, you're amongst fellow like obsessed uh, nerds who absolutely this is just, you know, everything drumming is uh, is, is what we all love. So um, you're amongst friends here. I love that. Well, Gil, why don't we jump right in and go back to the beginning and start with the origins of reggae drumming? Just a side note, especially for the listeners, besides the Jamaican styles of music, I'm also a total jazz head. So Mm. a lot of the comparisons that I make explaining the Jamaican styles of music and the subgenres, like you're going to hear me throw a lot of jazz comparisons and compare certain players or how things work musically to jazz. So let's start from the beginning. And we start in Jamaica. Um, basically before reggae came, there's a a lot of people think it's like just reggae and then everything is under the reggae genre, but it's not. Um, we start with ska and a lot of people kind of think, oh, they heard of ska in like the nineties from bands from like Orange County, or they Mm -hmm. heard of ska in like the early eighties from this two-tone movement. And we'll get to all of that, but that is not at all what started everything. So when you go to 1950s Jamaica, before ska even started, the musicians were highly influenced, of course, from what was happening in the States mm-hmm. with jazz, yeah. with um, with blues, with there's Afro-Cuban influence, there's Latin influence. There were also Calypso styles and styles called Buru drumming, which were being played by a set of drummers on Mm. hand percussion as opposed to a drum set. But then the Buru style really got coined by one man who we just have to just talk about and give props to. And everybody needs to know who this man is. His name is Lloyd Nib. And Lloyd was the godfather 
of pretty much all of these styles on the drum set. And we will get to Lloyd in a minute. So basically, before ska was coined in the late 50s into the early 60s, a lot of the Jamaican bands were just playing like this combination of like doo-wop, boogie-woogie, um, kind of blue beat type shuffle grooves. And that's what was happening on the drum set. It was either like a straight kind of boogie-woogie beat or a swung shuffle beat. And that's why I always tell people it's so important to develop a strong shuffle in your playing, not yeah. only to develop a jazz feel, but just other styles outside of jazz. There's still so much implied that you can't get from just playing straight patterns. Yeah. And like my buddy Stanton Moore, we did a whole show together several years ago where he talked about his New Orleans influence. I talked about my Jamaican influence and how they both influenced each other. But there's those that in in between the cracks type feel. So that's another important thing that you can get from understanding straight versus swung pulses. So Lloyd is pretty much credited as the creator of the ska beat. Some other uh, Jamaican musicians might say, oh, it was Winston Grennan. It was this guy. It was this guy. But I truly believe it was Lloyd. Um, his sound is undeniable. His influence is undeniable. Anybody that's ever played the music is basically copying Lloyd. Um, hmm. I know I do. <laughs> it's yeah, like, sure. Anybody that understands traditional Jamaican ska and the feel of what became everything after that, it came from Lloyd Nibb. So hmm. when you start with the with the very first style of music that came out of Jamaica, it is ska. And ska at the time, when you think about what was happening politically, Jamaica's independence in 1962, it was a very celebratory time. It was a happy time, which co clearly reflects in the style of the music of ska. So Lloyd told me the story that while he was recording tunes with Coxon, with Clement Dodd at Studio One, um, Coxon just said, let's change up the beat. Let's, let's try to give it a different feel because like I was saying, everything before that were like boogie woogie shuffles. So Lloyd came up with the signature inside out groove of what a shuffle would be, put it on the hi-hats and became this ska beat. In Wicked Beats, I demonstrate a very thorough breakdown of the ska pattern that I'm referring to. So if, if people aren't familiar with it, you know, they can check it out. But no other style of drumming before Lloyd created this pattern Nobody else was doing this. So this drum pattern was essential. It was it was a major factor in what created ska and why ska feels the way it feels. Yeah. It's a very it's a very dancey feel. It's very upbeat. Um the snare and the snare cross stick, the ska is pretty much especially traditional ska. It's always played with a cross stick it's sure. not played later styles get into hitting the the snare drum with a stick like a backbeat but this is a two and four cross stick and two and four bass drum in unison um against a very fun open swishy swing hi-hat pulse and yeah. then lloyd would do all these fun accents which you hear are just like clearly influenced from latin music and those those different cowbell kind of patterns that he pioneered on the hi-hat. No other drummers were doing that before Lloyd Nibb. Nobody in the States, nobody anywhere else that I know could take credit for what Lloyd was doing on the drum set in creating this style. And I even hmm. joke to some players that aren't familiar with what even the ska pattern sounds like or what these accents and riding the bell of the hi-hat sound like. When you listen to Rush and you listen to YYZ, Mm -hmm. And you hear Neil Neil get to the ride and he's playing that pattern, um, the broken up bell pattern. Yeah. That is a very staccato pattern and a rhythm that Lloyd would throw in his ska beat. So even if he was just doing uh swung uh, like a like a eighth note feel, he would play this cool bell pattern um in so many of the tunes. Like one off the top of my head, you can listen to Simmer Down, which is a classic ska tune. I think 
came out in 64 and the lead singer on that is Bob Marley. And that was before Mm. Bob was a superstar. This was early, early the Wailers. It wasn't even called Bob Marley and the Wailers in the 60s. It was just the Wailers and it was Bunny Wailer, Peter Tosh and Bob Marley and all three lead singers, you know, became reggae icons and superstars. Um, And we just recently lost Bunny Wailer. I had Mm -hmm. the honor of getting to spend time with Bunny and just, he was amazing. But anyway, Lloyd told me the story that Coxon was saying, let's change up the beat. Let's do something that's different. That's our own. And boom, the ska beat was created on the spot right there. And from then on, uh, through that era of that music into the mid 60s, it was a combination of Lloyd's signature ska groove and then still those kind of boogie woogie blue beat. I call them blue beat shuffles where a guys guys are almost playing a U.S. shuffle on the ride or the hi-hat, but hitting that cross stick on two and four in unison with the bass drum, which is much different of a feel than drummers in the States were doing, even with Boogie Woogie. Like you'd have guys playing four on the floor with the kick versus just a unison cross stick and bass drum accent on two and four. It's a very different feel. Yeah, for sure. Now, can I ask you too, were they... In the studio at this point with the, I guess it would just be considered ska, were they applying as many, you know, heavy reverbs and delays that reggae is kind of, I I say, quote unquote, reggae, you know, overarching term that it's become famous for with like the the super long echo. Was that being used yet? No, no, not yet. Not yet. We'll get we'll we're going to get to that. But the the recordings of ska um, were very much just pure it was live you know you'd hear some horns like out of tune it was just live these these guys were they were recording on the spot it was like the wrecking crew they would just do these tunes they didn't spend all day on one song that lloyd would tell me back in the day in the 60s he would do a session with coxon and then as soon as he was done he'd run over to duke reeds and then prince buster would see him driving in the street and say hey come to my studio after i got songs for you to do so <laughs> that's awesome the thing is what People need to research the Scottalites and the players in the Scottalites, all of them, the the rhythm section, both Lloyds, Lloyd Brevet and Lloyd Nib. And then you add Don Drummond on trombone, Roland Alfonso, Tommy McCook, Ernest Wranglin on guitar, Johnny Dizzy Moore on trumpet. So these guys were heavily influenced by jazz. And you can hear that in their melodies and their solos. They were telling you a story they were melodic it wasn't extremely technical but what it made up for in that respect it had all the feel and the expression in the world and that's another thing that drew me to the music not only the feel but what they had to say yeah and you know i love that early on you said that they were obviously influenced heavily by like you know western music and jazz and blues but like you also mentioned that then ska and then into the further you know iterations of it influenced the whole rest of the world so it's kind of this give and take of like uh they're they're taking things that motivate them in a certain way that that influence them in a certain way and then they give it right back and that changes the 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 face of music uh it's just such a cool and jamaica is a small country too so it's it's really cool that they had such a huge impact people borrow from their influences all the time you know it's like everybody so many people have said you know the best musicians steal and yeah. but the the difference is they make it their own and that's what jamaica did they they took all of these styles they fused them together and created their own their own signature style which then like you said influenced the rest of the world like we wouldn't have the police we wouldn't have the clash uh culture club um you know i'll get to all that more of the modern bands heavily influenced by jamaican so Back to the 60s. So yes. now now you're listening to this style of music that's super upbeat. It, it feels great. People can't stop dancing to it. And now here comes the introduction to rock steady, mm. which is the next style that started to come before reggae. So you have all these people in the dances dancing and they want to break you know it's like give me a slow jam you know you don't go to the club and then you're just always dancing to the same tempo you got to change it up or even in modern day you walk into a club whether it's like an edm thing or a hip-hop thing or what or funk or disco 
as soon as that DJ drops it or drops the tempo to a slower thing, everyone's like, oh, damn. So <laughs> that's that's basically when how Rocksteady came into play, where it was time to kind of slow things down and give it a cooler sound. Um, the characteristics of the bass and the guitar and the drums, the whole rhythm section vibe changed. And it was such a perfect compliment. And the really, really deep, deep, conscious stuff didn't come into play until reggae was coined um ska and rocksteady were both happy music rocksteady you know lyrics it's almost similar to like 50s doo-wop it's it's love songs and it's it's got such a cool sound and you know joe isaacs another major pioneer as far as rocksteady drumming goes he was one of the house drummers for studio one that feel was the perfect balance. And again, you can say, okay, what's the difference between ska drumming and rock, rock steady drumming? And yeah. there's a major, major difference. Ska drumming had that open pulse on the hi-hat, that open, closed pulse, kind of swung, kind of straight, the bell accents. His Lloyd's, Lloyd Nibs fills were textbook. Like the vocabulary of ska drumming is just Lloyd all day. The Buru style of his drumming, which Stanton actually called me about and said, yo, I'm blown away by the, the Buru stuff you're doing. It's so slick. And it just was awesome that he, but I wasn't surprised that he noticed that. Hmm. I said, awesome, man. I said, dude, I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're loving that. Then so that's what even started the conversation. He was so intrigued by it. He's like, man, I've, I've never even like heard that approach before. And I just say, it's Lloyd. I got it from Lloyd. And that's just straight up. So it's so exciting in those fills. So the Buru style drumming, which I mentioned earlier, was played by a group of drummers playing different percussion instruments. Lloyd took the bass drum and the toms and the snare drum to create the whole group in on the kit and he incorporated that in between the ska feel so when you go back and listen to anything Lloyd did with the Scottalites you're going to hear right away these fills I'm talking about hmm. so in rock steady that wasn't so much there so it's more stripped down basically or it it was it was very stripped down rock steady um, it pretty much gave birth to the one drop which everyone credits to reggae but yeah the, in rock steady is that's when we said okay look let's stop the swishy open hi-hats let's tighten up the hi-hats let's give a straight eighth note pulse come and then it's dancey it's light um the Carly Barrett hi hat, you know, variations. Those those weren't a part of the Rocksteady vibe. Rocksteady was very stripped down, straightforward. It's funny, guys that come to me and they're like, "Yo, I can't understand. I can't wrap my head around this reggae feel. Like, I need to hit the bass drum on beat one." <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, they they kind of they kind of have to get used to this inside out pulse. It's cool you just said that. So inside out pulse, really, that's referring to obviously basically flipping it where you're not playing yeah. on the one, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. So the one is empty. And that's one of the myths of where the term one drop comes from. There's, uh -huh. And I love that we can talk about this now because there's a debate where people ask, do you count reggae on beat three of a bar mm -hmm. or do you count it? Do you count it on two and four? No matter how fast it is or how slow it is, it's one, two, three, four. And I'm in that tempo, I'm counting that cross stick and kick on one, two, three, four. And that's slow. We can get even slower. If it's fast, once, two, three, four. Once, boom, boom, yeah, boom. So when I did the DVD, I was explaining, you know, one of the myths of it being called a one drop is because there's only one drop in the bar, which is on beat three. And a lot of people connect to that. When I talk to my Jamaican influences about these styles of music, they'll all say the same common thing. The main difference between those three styles of ska, rock, steady, and reggae would be tempo. It helps define what was going on. You have ska, which is your upbeat, dancey, rock, steady, which time to slow things down in the dance halls. It's a, it's a cooler 
feel the dance to even in ska they one of the style of dancing is called skanking you know mm-hmm. and yeah what the gu- what the guitar player is doing on upbeats is skanks the piano horns skanks on the upbeats so if they're all on upbeats then it's clearly two and four are your downbeats are your backbeats instead of thinking of if you're counting it as a beat three in the bar, then two and four are now your upbeats. You know what I mean? And they're not upbeats anymore. Those are, those are downbeats. So again, it's, if the feels right and you're playing it with the right intention, then the debate isn't that hardcore. But in Mm -hmm. reality, I like to say it and the way I count it off the way Carly, listen, uh, when you get to reggae, those real deep, slow, like burning spear tunes or it, or any of the slow Bob Marley tunes, it's one, two, bat, brat, boom, boom, and we're in. Yeah, it's for not sure. one. He, you don't hear Carly going one, two, one, two, three, four. You know, it's not like that. So <laughs> no, we're keeping we're keeping the quarter note pulse slow in reggae. So I, I definitely yeah. like to say it's two and four. That's the traditional way. It's starting faster and slowing it all the way down, but you're still playing it on two and four. Yeah. And what, what you just did there though, kind of, you mentioned it earlier, but I think it's, there's the classic and I guess you said Lloyd Nib, it goes back to him. He was like the prototype, but those, the fill in is very iconic where even on like, you know, a very famous Bob Marley album or something, you can start it and it's, and then the next song is that dude, the next song they're, they're really, I mean, a lot of songs start with the fill in, which yep. is kind of an yep. iconic thing. Definitely. And those fills are so signature and they start really from Lloyd. Carly will even say, if if he was still here, I learned from watching Lloyd Nib. Sly Dunbar is going to say, Santa's going to say, Horsemouth is going to say, all these legendary reggae players are all going to say they were all under the school of Lloyd Nib, just like myself. And mm-hmm. that's where I developed a lot of my roles from. Even before I got like really deep into reggae, I was uh, kind of more into ska first and all the phrasings and the fills that Lloyd was doing and the crack on the snare and the setups. Again, a lot of those melodies, especially with the traditional ska in the 60s, they're very jazzy. So Lloyd was able to play as groovy and as swinging as hard as he was, but have the attitude, his cross stick. Oh my, Lloyd taught me how to do the way he does his cross stick. I've never seen anybody do it like that. I've totally stole that from Lloyd, like so much of that. I can't say enough about what I got from him, but yes, those reggae fills for sure became just signature. Yeah. Especially when Carly came out, like there were other drummers that did amazing things. But Carlton, Carly's sound was, I think, the epitome of what anybody thinks of when they think of reggae drumming. So when you have these, at this point, three genres, we'll call it ska, Jamaican ska, rock steady and reggae. Would would one band who's playing ska not ever play rock steady or would these be you'd be playing all three genres in one night at the dance hall? Ska and Rocksteady were primarily grouped together, I feel, especially through the 60s. And then reggae was kind of its own beast when that took over. Now, before we move further on into reggae, just kind of like in this, you know, let's call it the origins. What was like a drum setup like? Because again, Jamaica, it's not like you're in America where there's all these huge brands. It's not even like you're in Europe where there's massive manufacturing. Like, where would they... Were there Jamaican brands? Where would they be getting the drums? Would it be imports? How, how would that work? In the 60s, they were playing, you know, old Ludwigs, the, mm-hmm. you know, Gretsch, just whatever they could get their hands on. The one important thing to realize, too, it's music from the ghetto. So it's not like everyone was just like flossing the brand new drums and cymbals <laughs> and the high end. Yeah. You know, the ska sound and the Roxetti sound was a wide open sound. It was... It was like a, a jazz, whether it was a big band or a small group, it had that kind of sound to it. The snare would have a crack. The snare would ring. It was open. The cross stick would breathe. It wouldn't sound completely dead and gated and muffled. Um, Everything was open and natural. And it really wasn't until reggae hit that 
you you hear the signature like put a chamois over the snare or mm-hmm. the the heads are so beat up and and broken <laughs> that there's just like five layers of tape over the heads and yeah. everything's very but not only did that just work out because people were playing on the gear that they had but it also sonically defined this music where the space and the discipline as a player comes in to play where when you're listening to a lot of reggae records especially roots reggae everything is very tight in the drums it's they're not ringing the toms aren't taking up you know 10 bars after the fill is done it's the the snare will will be either very dead and you're and fat sounding or it'll have the carly sound which almost sounds like a timbale and I even talk about that and I show two examples of different, like this is my 60s era drum set, full on classic four piece, open, no muffle. Then you get to reggae and now I'm dampening the head, um, the toms. I usually use two different snares, one a fat snare, one a ring tight snare and a timbale. Also, symbol wise. There were guys that, you know, were playing on crack cymbals. It's yeah, because really. there wasn't there wasn't the money to get brand new cymbals or whatever was in the studio is what was being used on this record. So that also became another sound. You don't hear a lot of big fills and then a cymbal crash every four bars in reggae. That again comes into play with the discipline of understanding that music. There's this stereotype where you have to hit like a lot of splash cymbals and crashes. And mm-hmm. that's like that's a way more bastardized version of what people think reggae drumming is than what authentic reggae is. Like when you see me in a reggae setting and I know I'm not playing any ska, I don't even use a ride symbol. Like <laughs> none, none of the legends that I learned from are using ride symbols in roots reggae. It's you're it's, you want it to be tight and you're playing the time on the hi hats that, can be manipulated by opening and closing and how tight you're squeezing them. But on a ride, it's just so out of character to be doing that. I mean, you don't really hear much ride in no. any of this music. And But everything you're saying is, is about it being like a part of the vibe. It's like you watch old videos or anything, and it's like it's usually kind of a, in a good way, kind of a broken down looking drum set with cracked symbols, yep. but it's a part of the vibe. And they're usually oh. in like a studio with like 35 people standing around. <laughs> like, yeah. you, know, yeah. you know, it's like, it's a feel. Uh, it's and very it's just much. great. Very much. And and that that's a good segue now to explain what now that we're jumping into reggae, Naya Bingi drumming is such an important aspect. The whole marriage between the Rastafarian culture and Naya Bingi drumming this is a a very deep spiritual religious ceremony that's happening and yeah. by the smoking and chanting and having these these drums playing in a group it could be three drummers it could be 20 and it's heavy 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 feeling hmm. and it's the heartbeat literally the heartbeat pattern of the bingi drumming boom boom yeah boom boom cha cha boom boom Boom, boom. And that tempo can be faster. It could be slower. So it's a correlation, a direct correlation of bingy drumming and fills and phrasing. Uh, the lead drum, the repeater, the kete, it's it's like hand in hand. When you hear me play the bingy drum and the way I phrase fills on a bingy drum, if I pick up sticks and play the drum set, it, I'm going to phrase fills that way too. So there's a vocabulary that gets established in a marriage. So it's really important when you understand reggae drumming that you also are aware of Naya Bingi drumming and how mm. deep that is. To me, it's kind of fascinating how uh, Rastafarianism, which is a religion, is so closely tied to a music where yeah. it doesn't happen. I mean, you think of like gospel music or something here and, you know, around the world, but, um, and I'm sure there's tons of examples of it, but when people think of, and it might be incorrect, but when people think of reggae, they typically think of Rastafarians and things like that. Like it's, it's just a unique, um, how connected they are is pretty wild. Yeah. So reggae, you said 
70s we're we're basically entering that time and things changed it obviously like you said it blew up and the world you know kind of began to notice it fair mm-hmm. enough right definitely definitely you had just songs that and artists that were just undeniably just touching the rest of the world but guys like chris blackwell and other key players that were able to bring awareness to these artists you know that might not have ever been known outside of jamaica it it was because of guys like chris blackwell that were able to say hey i'm gonna introduce you guys to the world to the rest of the world to the uk to the us like and that's when other people started paying attention and catching on to this is like turning into a form of almost pop music Mm -hmm. yeah like you said with like the police and those bands and like um I mean, it's just, I feel like it's that, the skank, it's the beat, Mm -hmm. and that just really translates. I mean, it's it's happy music that everyone likes to listen to. Obviously, there's slower songs, but it's got such a good feel to it. It's kind of, um, you know, it's a no-brainer that it struck a chord with everyone. Oh, yeah. Even, you know, the Rolling Stones and working with Bob and Peter Tosh and just these world, like, superstars working with these Jamaican artists. But as far as what was happening with... Now, drumming, you had Mm -hmm. the Roots reggae feel, which is the one drop and the steppers pattern and the rockers pattern, which I kind of coined, I coined as a rockers pattern because it feels like a rock beat. So some guys will talk about rockers as a, as a genre, and that's fine. The, The way that I refer to rockers is taking Uh, the beat and you're not playing a one drop anymore, which would be for people that don't know the cross stick and the bass drum in unison on two and four or beat three, however you feel it. It's, it's now playing like a rock beat where the bass drum, let's say for instance, is on beat one and, and three and your snare drums on two and four. Mm. So you have that, that boof, boof, bath, boof, bath, one, two, three, four, and then your skank. So that's another style that now opened up the floodgates for the reggae feel. Now you have stuff you can take from ska. You can take stuff from Rocksteady. You can take stuff from Roots Reggae. Now you got Rockers style. You got the Rub-A-Dub style. This is before rappers were rapping. You had guys in Jamaica they, it's called toasting. It it was just such a massive influence on the culture. Before we go too far further, I want to. You, you mentioned yeah. scientist. Um, I grew up in in high school loving. I think it was King Tubby meets scientist. Um, yeah. and I'm sure there's there the names of those like dub albums were awesome. Yeah. There's just so yeah. many like that. Is now a good time in the timeline to maybe pause and talk about dub music? And I I kind of think of it as engineers being the like. The stars. Musicians, yes. the stars. It's it's sort of yeah. a unique type of music, which maybe is like a precursor in, in uh, I don't want to offend anyone, but maybe a cooler version of like modern DJs. Dude, check this out. Dub was the birth of the remix. Uh-huh. Can you define dub before we go? Because maybe yes. someone out there doesn't know. So, so lay it out as what yes. it is first. Dub is the engineer manipulating a reggae tune to give the bass and drums even more in the forefront and add effects and drops and filters to the horns or the vocals or the guitars or any top line things that were happening would be affected or muted and really let the bass and drums shine and drive the track. Hmm. It's a remix and it's the engineer saying, this is now my time to shine. A lot of Jamaican artists and producers were releasing the A side would be the vocal version and the B side would be the dub version. Hmm, that's awesome. So yeah. so there would be releases and that's why my group that I'm currently in Gil Migs and Raj, we, our formula is that we do our instrumental version and it's a dub, but then we also get vocalists to come in and do a vocal version of the tune. So we kind of start the other way around. We start as a pure instrumental rhythm, and then we get people to do a vocal after instead of starting with the vocal version of a tune and then remixing that. So, but we're, it's just like a complete salute 
to the Jamaican culture and how things were working in the 70s with that. And even before the 70s, like when you have a, a, a producer like King Tubby or Lee Perry or Scientist, they're hearing a tune and they're saying, now I'm going to remix this song. And this is how I hear this remix. But this is all before automation too. So you yeah, have to course. realize that the art form of dub was these guys were like octopuses. Like Mm -hmm. they had to move a fader and do a mute and do a filter sweep and add a delay and add a reverb. They're all doing this in real time. This isn't, okay, let's run it back and now do the delays on the snare. Now let's run it back and put the filters on the hi-hats. This is all being done in real time with analog gear. Nobody else taught these guys that. They invented it. Now, and for non-engineer, most people know this, but automation, obviously, the Gil just mentioned refers to like you do a passive automation where you can ride the fader in like uh, in like touch mode in Pro Tools or latch or there, there's these modes where you're moving the faders and then you hit stop and it's going to it's writing these moves you just made. So every time you play, it's going to be doing the exact same thing. So obviously what you're referring to is is. They, that didn't exist so like you get one pass through to get it right and oh crap we turn you know it didn't it didn't take right or something like that it's so important to say the octopus arm where you're moving everywhere it's yeah. like exactly wild. and and if something got messed up in the take and that's why actually that's pretty common you'll hear like good mistakes or you'll hear like legendary hip-hop producers like like rizzo from wu-tang it's like he'll say oh that beat ended up being like a mistake because something you know was in record mode and it shouldn't have been and it ended up blah 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 but i kept it so yeah sometimes there's things that were like good mistakes that were stuck on the track because they didn't go back and redo it it was what you got at that time was what you got um scientists now you know he's he's not afraid to use digital stuff he he he's very particular on what he'll work on what console he'll work on but he'll still ro- record into Pro Tools. But it's so fun to watch him. Like even with our stuff, he'd do like two passes of each tune. So mm. he'd do he'd do a dub. And then when he heard it, he'd be a little more familiar with the tune. And then he'd just run another one. But it was it's such a pleasure to watch him and see how it's done. So with, with that dub influence, people ask, oh, is that the same as dubstep? It's like, no. Dubstep is a <laughs> dubstep yeah, is a totally different genre and style of music of course there's some influence from where dub came from but sure. yeah that that again dub was really the birth of of the remix yeah and the the iconic like i mentioned before the super long the the, the snare delay echo that will go for super long there'd be I, I feel like there's always a lot of trumpet and horn involved in a lot of dub um those sounds and just these these the which I think that those effects across the board yeah. um, as an engineer uh, and as you are yourself and most now modern day drummers have some engineering experience and all that stuff. But it's just that really pushed forward engineering, I feel like, and adding effects and going okay. like way oversaturating everything and realizing, wow, that sounds awesome. You know, keep it. Exactly. There are no rules when it comes to that. And it was the effects shine, the guys using the effects shine. Um, But again, like I tell purists or guys that are like, I can't believe he muted that beautiful snare drum or I can't (laughs) believe he killed those toms. It's like, yo, this is the sound. This is deliberate. It's it's not like, oh, we made a mistake. Sorry to the purists that are afraid to like do anything outside of the norm. When I hear a King Tubby mix, I know it's they had their own sound. Mm-hmm. Like when when I hear Max Roach and Tony Williams, I know who's who. When I hear a Tubby dub and a Scientist dub and a Prince Jammy dub or a Mad Professor dub, I know who's who. They all had they all have their sound and their take on it. And yeah. um, it's an amazing thing. But yeah, those filters and those delays, I'm, I'm in love with that stuff. I, I can't get enough of that. Yeah, it's so analog and just awesome. But um, okay, so for the sake of time, let's chug forward here. Uh, so yeah. we were in the 70s. Dub is happening, obviously. But reggae, 
bands are popping up in the world that are influenced by it. Obviously, The Clash. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that those bands come off as like bastardizing that type of music because I love The Clash. I love The Police. I mean, they they yeah. do it well. Yeah. Do you know how reggae players felt about that happening? Their their style spreading to the rest of the world? Yeah, I can't speak for everybody, but from the ones that I know directly and and what I've seen also in interviews or reading about, they were they loved it. They were very into the influence. Like Lee Perry produced the the Clash went to Jamaica and worked with Lee Perry and he actually kind of insulted how bad they were at reggae, which is funny, <laughs> you know, like it's but at the same time they had a charm to their sound. Like when the Clash plays reggae, it doesn't have to sound like Sly and Robbie. It doesn't have to sound like the Wailers. It doesn't have to sound like Roots Radix. They they had a charm. You could tell they loved the music, but they played it their kind of sloppy mm-hmm. punk punk rock way. But one very important bridge to talk about to getting there is the the uh, era of two tone ska. So from the late seventies. Uh, the mid to late seventies, there was a strong, of course, Jamaican relationship with the UK. And a lot of those bands were loving reggae, but they were also filled with angst and punk rock energy. So now you have two tone ska, which is faster. Uh, the driving beat of the bass drum through what I call a stepper's pattern. It's riding through doots, doots, bats, doots, 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 bats. And the guitar skanks are still there, but the main, the the primary bands that were a part of the two tone movement, the English Beat, the Specials. Yeah, you read my mind. Madness, um, the Selector. There's even a very iconic two tone live album called Dance Craze, and it's got all the checkerboard imagery and the two tone and the ska, the the skank and rude girl. Um, that is all started from 60s ska influence but now we're in the late 70s and like i said they have reggae to choose from they have rock steady and ska it's all it's all been established already plus they're mixing it with punk i had the honor of playing with dave wakeling who was the lead singer of the english beat like talk about another pioneer of that style of music that now i'm in his band for (laughs) almost three years i'm young the, all the dudes in the band had like a nickname for me. They call me Young Drummy or or Young Buck, and <laughs> like it was amazing to play that style of music with the guy that founded and created that style. And for people that don't know the English beat, you've heard their music in countless movies and radio, um, yeah, all over the radio. And even Sting is wearing an English beat shirt in a couple police videos. Like, don't stand so close to me. You see the beat girl, that iconic beat rude girl which is an influence from jamaica but it's it was a very like uk thing yeah the and the little hats just even the style exactly. of like i saw exactly. them i saw uh the rx bandits open up for the english beat um f- i was in high school I mean, it was years ago but cool. just unbelievable i mean and that's yeah. another rx bandits are another modern band that uses that kind of reggae style um which that's, is that's the third wave yeah yeah, exactly. So yeah, that imagery, and again, you have the culture. So with you know, you have the imagery, very strong Rastafari. Then the last wave of ska to hit, which is referred to as third wave ska. And you know, bands in the eighties were playing third wave. You had guys like bands like Operation Ivy, um, Skank and Pickle, like oh man, there's just so many. But then bands in the nineties that started to break on like commercial rock radio like bands like Real Big Fish, and of course, No Doubt. So bands like No Doubt really opened up another um, just kind of awareness to to reggae and ska because Gwen in interviews and and Tom and all those, and Tony and Adrian, they would say, we love ska. We love two-tone ska. We love reggae. We love bands like Fishbone. Like No Doubt wouldn't exist. Our sound, our style would not exist if it wasn't for these bands that came before us and these styles of music. And then there's Cali Roots Reggae, which is that mixture of that kind of sublime sound in which now Miguel from my group, Gil, Migs, and Raj, Miguel, who was part of that original sublime crew and kind of helping create that California sound that people refer to. So Mm -hmm. I've I've had this amazing 
you know, opportunity to work with so many of these legends and all the different eras of this, these styles of music. Well, to keep it, and then, and, and, I mean, unbelievable. And just to back up to that third wave, to keep it drum related, I always think of a lot of Orange County drums and percussion, a lot of OCDP <laughs> drums, <laughs> you know, that was yeah. like, which are amazing drums, but it's like, that was the, and I remember, Go- I remember looking it up one time, like, I think I was in like grade school. I was like, you know, how much are these drums? And I wanted to like piece it together and you could like kind of price it out. It was like, oh, the kid I want is $7,000 or something <laughs> right, right, like that. Right. But, um, and very clean and, and like sharp, I, honestly, maybe it's a contrast to like the original gritty drum set of broken cymbals and stuff to then have this, yeah. I mean, you know, a Travis Barker, I know he's not reggae, but you know what I mean? Orange right. County, yeah. like $15,000 drum set with sparkling a custom cymbals, right. It's kind of a polar opposite side on, on gear, but they had those, you know, like uh, Adrian Young with like the jelly bean kind of multicolored exactly. kit. Um, yep. Yep. Just stylistically, and it's different. I feel like the influence Stuart Copeland had on drummers, mm-hmm. um, he single-handedly bridged like roots reggae to like two-tone modern rock, uh, almost progressive rock in a way. Yeah. Um, but the sound of his snare and then, of course, the splashes, I think that's where sure. a lot of people disconnect and they connect that with like authentic roots reggae. But it's really like this strong Stuart Copeland influence because the police was such a massive band still just like their hits are played all the time everywhere. And that drummer, just like you'd hear Carly with Bob Marley and Carly wasn't the only drummer that played with Bob Marley. He's definitely the most iconic. And that sound is signature now bands in the two tone ska and the third wave ska. They're now like, well, wait a minute. We have this modern gear. We're Mm -hmm. playing loud, distorted guitars. We're playing with rock bands and punk bands and we're fusing punk and rock into this style with a reggae and a ska influence. Let's just do our thing with it. And of course, the sound of the snares and the cymbals had to cut that. That was another influence. Now you're competing with like big distortion guitars and like a marching band of horns blowing, you know? Yeah. And I mean, with Stuart Copeland, you got to it's like it gets like a caveat of like he's also like a virtuoso amazing not that these other guys aren't but he's special Stuart Copeland mm-hmm. as a drummer is just like his ability is very 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 high I mean in in that era of just like he, he he's up there with the best of them um for sure for sure so that's completely. worth worth noting yeah completely so getting to you and the modern you know what you're doing which is being basically a great ambassador to um reggae music and like i said at the very beginning where people may think, why aren't you getting like a traditional Jamaican reggae drummer? It's like, I think now everyone understands that Gil is a real (laughs) deal, traditional reggae drummer. Um, So, I mean, it's out there. Wicked Beats is out there. Where can people like, where can people get it? All that good stuff. I mean, I I feel like that was unless unless I'm jumping the gun, but that was like an unbelievable um, and it's not over, right? Yeah. To back up a little bit and say you said the third wave, it's still people are still playing reggae all the time. I mean, and and ska, oh, yeah. it's it's still going. Yeah, and and then the marriage to hip hop and dance hall and you know, there's and the electronic influence and the electronic era. So, I feel like we covered a lot of ground. Of course, there was a lot of other stuff I could have mentioned, a lot of other names I could have mentioned. This was a great conversation to understand where things came from, how they developed. And and with me not even being behind a drum set, like ideally, yeah, for sure, I, I can do I can do this conversation sitting behind a drum set and literally like playing everything for you. But um, it's important to educate people, just like I said with jazz. There's a big difference of how you're going to play in a bebop group in a bebop setting than you would in a big band. Or if you're playing a ballad with brushes, then you're not just gonna you know step all over the song and and play busy and fill things up. It's the discipline in reggae for a drummer is such a huge part of understanding the feel of it. Um, cause, and that's one last thing I'd even want to end with where drummers might say, oh, that's easy. You're just doing the same thing over and over again. Mm-hmm. Good point. It's so much deeper and it's so much yeah. more than that. Plus, there's a lot of variations that are really difficult. So I, I hope this gets people to want to dig in and kind of check out these pioneers that I'm talking about and even Carlton Barrett. like. 
the the magic of his hi hat patterns. I I refer to Carly as the Tony Williams of reggae. Like mm-hmm. what he did, his phrasings, his setups, his sound. God, it's you know, it's it's no different than studying a pioneer like Bonham with rock and Elvin Jones with jazz. It's Carly and Lloyd, those guys, they all need to be studied equally. The cool thing is, is I mean, uh, there's so many great genres of music out there, but it's it's reggae and all of these subcategories, gym, like ska, all this. It's really fun to listen to for everyone. So it's like, you know, your wife or husband or girlfriend or parents, like most people like reggae. You know what I mean? Like most yeah. people enjoy that kind of music. Whereas if you're listening to like, um, well, as a former, as a member of Dillinger escape plan before <laughs> your mom might not like Dillinger escape plan as much, you know, yeah, or, or that's, Marilyn. That's a, little, <laughs> that's a little heavy. Yeah. It's harsh. Exactly. And and there's a time and a place. Cause look, I'm not always in the mood to hear that kind of music, let alone play it. So whatever mood you're in, let that cater to what you want to listen to. I'm, I'm not always sure. going to listen to Dillinger and no, Dillinger's awesome though. I mean, I, I should say that yeah. as a kid, I got a secondhand copy of uh, Calculating Infinity, and it's just like uh, you know, it's nuts. It's, it's nuts. It's, it's insane. It's it's, so- <laughs> it's it's totally nuts, and I and it's, it's amazing, and it's some it's musicianship at its highest level. And some people might hear it and like say it's unlistenable, but any musician with any kind of technical understanding would say that is almost impossible to play. Perfectly said. It is extremely hard to, to play, but <laughs> yeah. but because reggae comes off as quote unquote easier doesn't mean that yeah. it's it is easier. It just means it's I mean, it's a different feel. It's a different vibe, which which it's it takes a lot of skill for a man like you to have. T- those are two extremes. So yeah. uh, you've you've got it figured out for sure, Thank you, man. Thank you. Appreciate Absolutely. It. Well, um, you can go to gilondrums.com, G I L on drums.com or Gil Sharon, S H A R O N E.com. Um, Gil, this is just awesome. Everyone should check out wicked beats and Gil's latest project, Gil Migs and Raj. Um, on that note, yeah. Gil, thank you so much, man. I mean, we kind of met through Instagram and just sort of, yeah. uh, went back and forth and I'm so happy to have you on the show. Dude, thank you. Thank you again. And thanks to the listeners. I hope you guys enjoyed this. All my socials are just at Gil Sharon. Hit me if you guys have any questions or want to know more about this. And you can keep an eye out for all the other projects I have in reggae and everything else I do outside of reggae. Awesome. Thank you, Gil. Take care. Thanks. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.